Department of Applied Computing here at Michigan Tech. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, uh, Tom Kelly, who's the CEO of Automation Alley. Um, before doing that, let me just say a few very quick words about our relationship uh, at Michigan Tech with Automation Alley. Automation Alley. Uh, I first became familiar with it about six or seven years ago and had lunch with Cynthia Hutchinson, who's still in a leadership position there. thought it was very interesting. thought it was something I wanted to be involved in. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, uh, when we were having the discussions about the creation of the College of Computing at Michigan Tech, we invited Pavan Mazumdar, who's their COO, to come facilitate some of the uh, uh, discussions that we were having on campus about that, and that worked out really well. And, and in fact, I ended up uh, stealing a lot of the graphics from his slides that he presented there, uh, and I've, I've often put them in my own presentations with attribution, of course. Um, so since then, we've presented, we've uh, 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 had a couple of articles in their annual technology and industry uh, uh, publication. We participated in some of their World Economic Forum roundtables. Um, we've attended their Integrate conference. Uh, we even sent a faculty member to the uh, Hanover Messe uh, uh, delegation to the Hanover Messe trade fair in Germany. Uh, but really, I think these are just baby steps, um, and I and I think there's more that we can do, and so I hope we can explore that, especially with having Tom here this week, uh, especially considering that Michigan Tech, you know, is the only university in Michigan who, in their founding legislation from 1885, says that we exist in part uh, to support the welfare of the industries of the state, okay? And that's exactly the mission of Automation Alley as well, right? They, they exist to sort of support and educate um, uh, uh, small and medium-sized businesses in Michigan all around uh, Industry 4.0 and to help them sort of navigate the challenges of digital transformation. So I'm, I'm hoping that there's more that we can do that comes out of this uh, relationship today. So, um, so with that, let me say a few words about Tom. Okay, He uh, uh, got his uh, undergraduate degree from Clarkson University in upstate New York, which is kind of a peer institution to Michigan Tech. Um, uh, you know, a, a small, medium-sized STEM university in, in the snow belt. Um, and he also has an, uh, an MBA from the University of, of Michigan. Um, he's had leadership positions at, at numerous companies uh, that involve with automation, industrial production, and entrepreneurship. Um, and at companies like Invatech and Delago Technologies and Kelly Insight, and all the time, all the while providing counsel to technology firms under the Michigan uh, Small Business Development Council. Um, and now he's the executive director and CEO of Automation Alley. Uh, which is a nonprofit Industry 4.0 Knowledge Center, uh, and he's been there for nine years. And and so with that, Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, Dan. I, re I really appreciate. It. Thank you, everybody, for for inviting me up. Um, you know, I moved to Michigan in 1988. I uh, came out of Clarkson, uh, which is a little better than RPI, but other than that, <laughs> I'm kidding for it. Um, I came out of Clarkson as an electrical engineer, came up to Detroit to do factory automation, um, and never got a chance to get up to this, this beautiful UP. And my daughter is now a senior and is looking at colleges, and I've got her convinced to be an engineer, and we came up to look at Michigan Tech, and it's, a, it's beautiful, and I hope my daughter makes her choice here because I'm thinking, can I go here? This is this is wonderful. I mean, I, I, I feel like I've been, you know, disenfranchised by not finding out about this sooner. And now I've been here twice, so it's really, really fun. So thanks for having me. Um, I open with uh, this little quote that I love. Life is 1% inspiration, 98% perspiration, and 2% attention to detail. And I, I love that because it's in an engineer's heart. Uh, to think in these terms. And what I'm going to talk about today is how artificial intelligence and 3D printing and distributed manufacturing, which is an outcrop of artificial intelligence and, distributed, and, and 3D printing, is really going to change what we think we know about manufacturing. And it's really going to change how we perhaps teach engineering going forward. Um, and these are sort of heretical statements. but. Uh, I wanted to share with you that the presentation I give today is the same presentation or thoughts that I share with CEOs all around the world when I speak to them in manufacturing. So we have the privilege, or I have the privilege, to have a lot of contact with some really high level people from around the world. I sit on the World Economic Forum Global Futures Council, and we get together twice a year somewhere around the world with lots of very people much smarter than I am talking about what's coming in the world. And these are people from China, from Germany, industrial powerhouses, 
right? Just uh, Mexico, all these places that have industrial policies tied to manufacturing. And it's great to learn from them. But when I come back, this is how I educate our industry, our CEOs of these companies. How do you need to think about the world going forward in the age of Tesla? How do you need to think about yourself as an auto company? Right? So let's see if um, we can, we can you know, set this up as, as briefly as possible uh, about who Automation Alley is. I think it might be important to give you a little background. So Automation Alley is actually made up of three companies, if you will. So there was Automation Alley proper, which is Michigan's Industry 4.0 Knowledge Center. Okay? We have about 2,300 members, a little more than that. I think we're pushing 2,500 now throughout the state. Over 2,000 of those are small manufacturers, right? There's, there's about 12,000 manufacturers by the MEDC's count in the state of Michigan. About 150 of them are really super big. The rest are all really small, really small, right? Mom and pop shops, the tens, the 10,000 of the 12,000 are mom and pop manufacturers. 2,000 of them are members of, of, of Automation Alley, so one-fifth of those small companies. And if you're not a member and you're in manufacturing, join us, doesn't cost anything. It's a library card. Because Michigan is, is uh, because Automation Alley is a knowledge center. And the idea is we want the manufacturers to have that knowledge. So come join us, be a part of this ecosystem. Uh, the rest of our ecosystem is made up of people like Michigan Tech, who is a great partner in us trying to educate industry and trying to match up your students and your capabilities with our ecosystem to try and stay ahead of this this grave competitive threat and I use the word grave understandably because manufacturing as we know it is going to change and we really need to pay attention we also have a division called the US Center for Advanced Manufacturing this was stood up last year in partnership with the World Economic Forum so the forum is a convening body around the world, and they convene the largest institutions from around the world. You may have heard of this Davos where people get together. In fact, it's used as a, as a pejorative more than it's used as a com complimentary thing. But they're a convening organization that tries to get their pulse on what's happening in the world. And they have 12 centers around the world. We are the only center focused on advanced manufacturing. So we are the forum's center for advanced manufacturing. That gives us great insight, yet again, into how is the world thinking about industrialization? How is Germany thinking about industrialization, right? It's very important because they're one of the leaders in terms of the Mittelstand. They're, Germany and Michigan are incredibly similar in how their economy and our economy is tied to manufacturing and how they have a bunch of little companies, family-owned businesses, they call them the Mittelstand, and how we have lots of small businesses uh, that are manufacturers, and so we want to share ideas back and forth. In fact, Fraunhofer, which is one of the leaders in Germany, the largest R&D for manufacturing in the world, a uh, $6 billion organization, they are on our board at the U.S. Center for Advanced Manufacturing because they help teach us what should we be paying attention to. And last, we have this division called Project Diamond, and I'll talk more on that. Diamond stands for Distributed, Independent, Agile, Manufacturing on Demand. So while we're educating manufacturers on how they need to think about the change in the world, we're also running a project where we have taken 300 small manufacturers. We gave them 3D printers that were production capable. This cost us tens of millions of dollars, by the way. We gave them printers. We taught them how to use them. And it was a grand experiment to say, what if you gave somebody who never had a printer before in manufacturing a printer that could actually, not to do prototyping, but to actually drive value in the organization and create things that could be sold or could be used in their own facility as MRO replacement parts. And we have 300 manufacturers now on this ecosystem. And the next phase, what we want to do is we want to stitch them all together so that they can do e-commerce with each other and they can take orders from outside the network. In other words, if I have 300 printers, I can make 300 things at a time. Think about that, and we'll get back to that. I don't need to necessarily invest in the capital in my own facility anymore, which is the way manufacturing has always been. Because you had to control the process through mechanical means, you had to own all, that, all those assets to make those parts. In the world going forward, in additive, 
I need to own the intellectual property, the design, but I can push a computer button and it can print anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world, at any moment's notice. So think about what that's going to mean to how we make things going forward. I've used the example, I don't need to mine chemicals and, 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 and resins from Brazil, ship them to China, squirt out a million Barbies in different colors and shades, put them in boxes, ship them to America, and distribute them to Target and Walmarts all over America. I'm just going to have 3D printers in the back of the Walmart store, or maybe even less, and they're going to print the exact Barbie that that girl or boy wants. Right? They're just going to print it, and it'll be to the exact specifications. Maybe it's got a different hair color, maybe it's a little plumper, maybe it's got all these features like Build-A-Bear. Right? Why would you make a million of something a year in advance to try and predict what the Christmas market's going to be in America two years from now? Which is what they have to do today to, to, to start that cycle. They're literally in their labs trying to figure out what are the products I need to make 12 months before because they got to get their order into China six months before Christmas. In fact, more like eight months before Christmas. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, if we see a world that's coming, how do we position manufacturers that are small to participate in that world, and how do we prepare our students to participate in that world? So with the background on who Automation Alley is, we are a nonprofit. We exist to create competitive advantage for Michigan. Simple. We exist to create competitive advantage for Michigan. What do we believe? We believe manufacturing will evolve rapidly towards this software-first AI mindset. You can see how that played out already in Tesla, right? Tesla has been around since like 2004. It's not like he crept up on the industry, right? He has been around and he has been very clear in saying, this is what I'm going to do. And nobody in the industry took him seriously. Even as GM and Stellantis went through bankruptcy and came out, Tesla was still a nothing. Tesla didn't get big until 2017. GM and Stellantis went bankrupt in 2010. They still didn't take him seriously. In fact, it was in 2010, as GM was going through bankruptcy, that Google showed up at GM and said, hey, we got this new autonomous car concept. Why don't we partner on it? GM said, we're GM. Why would we partner with you? So this idea of resisting change and resisting change couched in technology is deeply embedded in manufacturing. And the reason why it's deeply embedded, and this goes to engineering, right? All of us engineers, we kind of live in this world of making things, turning ideas into reality from the digital to the physical, right? That's what engineers do. They help get from an idea, from creative problem-solving issue, to an actual physical output, be it a product, be it a, 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 a system, be it whatever. That's what engineers do. But we resist change because we define what we know in the world by what we've been taught and what we can see. We're, doubter, we're doubting Thomases. And so we need to do a much better job of understanding that the world is changing so fast that the way to succeed and be successful is to collaborate like crazy and not try to own your corner of the world, but try and move really fast with the world. Try and ride the top of the wave rather than getting, uh, uh, you know, washed out by the by the tsunami. So we think it's going to be software first. Software combined with additive manufacturing, which we think the world will go to, slowly but surely, we think additive is going to take larger and larger chunks of what is traditional manufacturing. We're already seeing that. I have some examples that I'll share with you of how we are already seeing that playing out in industries that you would not expect at all, right? Um, one of them is automotive Tesla, but I have another example of another car company that's coming on the scene, and it's probably somebody you haven't heard of, but that's gonna be deeply impactful, and we'll talk about what's happening in, uh, in the, the manufacture of rockets. But if you take software and AI, and you add it to additive, the natural output of that is distributed manufacturing. Because once I digitize my design and my ability to make changes 
tied to AI informing me, can I do that, can I not do that? I don't have to go through all these steps of engineering to validate in the physical world. The computer tells me, yeah, it's good. And then I can push a button and it gets printed. So if the computer tells me I can print it, I can print it. I don't have to go bend all the metal and make all the machines and mill all the parts and do everything, put it all together and build the prototype. You don't need to put all the parts together anymore because it's 3D, you print them all in one go, right? The reason why we have tolerances in manufacturing is because things have to join up. If you don't have to join those things together, you don't need tolerances anymore, right? This is, this is like, I hope, you're gonna probably gonna burn me at the stake before I get out of here at the end of the day, but these are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about. It says, wait a minute, I need to think about engineering completely differently. I need to go all the way back to what's the problem I'm trying to solve? Not what machine do I need to build to get that done because the world is going to start to go more additive because of the design flexibility. Right? There's a company in Ann Arbor that is printing seatbelts for GM. The whole seatbelt, the buckle and the, the nylon. Be, why, why would you do that? It's more expensive than just getting the nylon seatbelt from the manufacturer that makes nylon seatbelts. By the way, if I had asked the CEO of the nylon company, do you think 3D printing is a threat to your business? I guarantee you he would say, oh, hell no. We make a nylon seatbelt. Why would that be 3D printed? Well, guess what? If you're a consumer and you want to put Tom Kelly in the belt, or you want to put I Love Michigan, or whatever, Michigan Tech, whatever you want to do, right? Why wouldn't you customize that? Guess what? GM's going to allow you to do that. Right? And so they have a manufacturer now, 3D prints belts. And guess what? The guy who's in the belt business says, why was I not R&Ding this kind of stuff? Because why did I not notice that that threat was coming? So we think distributed manufacturing. By the way, this manufacturer now can set up their 3D printing machine right alongside the plant in Lansing. They can set the machine up right alongside the plant in Pole Town. They can set it up right alongside the plant in Kansas City. And they can sit in Ann Arbor and push buttons. That's the uh, intent of the, the extent of their manufacturing, right? So these things are going to get wild going forward. So first was software first mindset. This is the AI that we're talking about. We're going to move from process to IP. What that means is typically in manufacturing and in engineering, First, you design the part. This is how it worked in my life when I was coming out of engineering, coming out of school, in a, in, a, in a typical auto plan or whatever. There were great designers and design engineers, and they would design the part, and it would be full of intent and customer sexiness. And then they would throw it over the wall to who? The design for manufacturing engineers, because they would get the part and say, God, those guys over there, they're idiots. They don't know anything about manufacturing. You can't make that part that way. So they would create another set of books. Literally, this happens, and it probably still happens today, where design would have their design drawings in their books. They don't do books anymore, but do that. And then manufacturing would have their own books that would be different, and they, they wouldn't communicate. So what was being made on the floor was different than what was actually designed. And the IP was lost because the design for manufacturing was all about how do I make this part based on the machinery that I have or can build? Because I'm capital constrained. I just can't go out willy-nilly building all these new machines to make it the way they want to do it. And maybe they had curves or they had, they had channels in the part that can't be made with the machining tools that we have today. So we have to re-engineer it and do something different. When you go to this software first mindset, the computer and AI will tell you, yeah, you can do that. You can either do it with the systems or you can do it with a new editor. It's gonna change how engineers and designers need to interrelate to each other pretty significantly. So that's causing business models to evolve rapidly. If your business model is moving from, I understand and own a process, do I have to understand and own software? That really changes everything. So there's a lot of evidence that the C-suite gets it. 
When I talk to executives, they get it. It's the middle manager, and the people on the floor get it because they see the, the rapid change that's happening. And it's the middle managers that really struggle to understand how to keep up with this change. So let me give you some examples of, of C-suite people that really get it. So Jamie Dimon has always said, you know, we're a software company that happens to be in the banking industry, right? But we're software first. Mary Barra has said, I hope by the time I retire, she said this like five years ago, so we'll see how she's doing. Tough time right now in the auto industry. She said, I hope by the time I retire that people will view GM as a software company that happens to make cars, right? She was well aware of what, what was happening with Tesla, right? So there's two sides to Tesla. There's Tesla on how they build the car in the factory, which creates competitive advantage for them. And there's Tesla, I'm gonna build a software platform that happens to have wheels. And all our adjustments are gonna be, are gonna be made in the software, as much as we can. And every time, the goal of the company is to eliminate as many physical components as possible and only have software drive all of the choices. Whether that's good or bad, I'm not here to debate that. What I'm saying is that's the choice he made and that's driving the whole industry now, that they need to do much, much more to keep up with that. So AI is leading the way and it's going way beyond chat GPT and what you hear in the news. You guys are better informed than I am, so I'm not going to try and debate a class full of academics and engineers on what, what, what the future of AI looks like. I know my place. But when I'm out speaking to CEOs and to business owners, what I'm saying is if you don't understand AI, you're toast today because no one's going to buy your business, right? You're already dead man walking. You don't, if you don't understand how AI and 3D printing and collaborative robotics are gonna come into your facility and change what you, what you do, you're already dead. No one's gonna give you capital, which means you can't get a, money from, you can't get a loan from a bank because Jamie Dimon already said, hey, we're a software company, how's your tech, what are you doing? Oh, you're, you're like an old capital process guy, I don't give you any money. This has played itself out. Tesla's worth $700 billion. GM and Ford are worth 30 billion each or something around there. Why? Because the people that have money, Wall Street, have voted and said, we value your future potential at zero because we don't think you can actually survive this change. We think your culture is so broken that the only way is just to shoot you behind the barn. Now, we desperately hope that doesn't come to fruition. But that's, that's the way people that are not in the auto industry, the way they're looking at Ford and GM and Stellantis is you're already dead. You just don't know it yet. How scary is that for Michigan? Right? And this is what we say to our, our executives. Guys, desperately you have to pay attention. If you don't understand AI, if you don't have a plan for how this is going to come into your business, you are not qualified to be the CEO. Right? That's a very... <laughs> I'm not, I don't make friends when I make that statement, but it's important, right? We have to tell people, listen, the world is changing like that, and we all need to keep up with that. It's not a luxury to say, well, you know, come along, let's, let's move as slow as you want. It's too late. We gotta go super fast. And here's the, the blessing, though. From 2000 to a couple years ago, Michigan had to live through China onboarding and China's domination in the world as, as the world's backdoor manufacturing facility. Basically, everybody in the world went to China to do their manufacturing because it was cheap, it was high quality, everything worked great, and China wanted that model. Because of digitization and the geopolitics that is playing out, America has never been in a better position to regain our manufacturing lead. When, when we are the country that consumes everything in the world, right or wrong, we consume everything, it all flows to us. The whole reason the world is not in recession today is because we buy stuff. That's why we're succeeding. Uh, the whole world is, 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 is doing well. It's because of America's huge engine of commerce that flows through everything. And that back door was China. We allowed that to happen, so we, 
we exported uh, all of our know-how and our manufacturing to get cheap goods to power the economy. Today, because of digitization, we're able to compete very successfully with China. We've lost our know-how, we've lost our industrial commons, which is, which is something we have to worry about. But we are in a great position, because why, if I can make it here and I can make it there, and it's gonna cost about parity now, why wouldn't I just make it here? Because this is where I'm gonna consume it. And we've, we've pulled that rubber band so tight where we've exported so much of, of, our, of our manufacturing capability that I'm gonna show you a slide where it shows how, how it's rapidly snapping back. So, 3D printing, we talked about this. We're gonna move from capital to competencies. What that means is this design for manufacturing is gonna to shift to design for additive manufacturing. And we all need to pay attention to that, right? What happens, I, I ask a couple hypotheticals to these owners when I talk to them. So what happens in my manufacturing process when knowledge is free and ubiquitous and can flow anywhere in the world instantly? That's the world we live in, that's what AI is gonna do. Most manufacturers exist because they have captured knowledge about a process that is unique to them, or unique enough that allows them to bid projects and win them with a margin. What happens when that knowledge is actually ubiquitous and free? You're gonna get lots of potential competitors that ha almost had the know-how you had and were manufactured down the street, but now they're like, I'll just Google it, I'll just BART it, I'll just AI it, whatever. I'll figure out how to do it. Oh, God, that's what they're doing? Oh, that's really clever, right? So there's gonna be all this fragmentation. What happens when the marginal cost of energy is free? That's another big trend in the world. So right now, the capital equation is I have to put, a, I have to spend big bucks to put solar panels in. Once I put the money in, the cost of that energy out is marginally zero. I have to repay the capital that it costs me to install all that, but the marginal cost is very, very, very low. And that trend is gonna play out significantly. So, you know, one of the things you should take away from this is Nobody's anticipating, there's a lot of circles that in the economic, economic side and, and other areas that I pay attention to and deal with where this is a big issue. They're like, main, um, energy is gonna trend towards free. What does that mean for manufacturing, especially in America, if you begin to marry um, uh, low cost electricity with, uh, with already the ability to put robots and AI on this kind of stuff? It's really gonna have a profound effect. So, the last is distributed manufacturing. We see a world, and again, this is our opinion, and we, we, we give this presentation to fill you full of, hopefully not rage, but questions. <laughs> right, the idea is not to make you angry, but to make you think about like, huh, I didn't think about the world that way, you know. We see a world where you're gonna move from these centralized manufacturing facilities that have knowledge on how their machines run to these distributed manufacturing. Some may be big, some may be little, right? I'm not questioning that, you know, how, how this is all gonna, gonna play out, but manufacturing is gonna fragment and distribute all around the world, right? Good for America, by the way, really bad for China. Right? They have to find a way to stay relevant in this world that starts to fragment back to the economies where the goods are being sold. Right? That's why China is desperate to create a consumer-led economy. They're desperate to create because They need to create wealth for themselves so their people can buy the goods that they're making. Because they see the same trend we do, which is, holy cow, people are going to start making where they, where they sell. And this is not a good business model for us, right? But it's a great business model for America. And this is why we work with HP on this very model, because HP's in the 3D printing business. Of course they want to see this come to fruition. And we want to see this come to fruition because we think this is great for America, we think this is great for small business, right? Right now it's very, very hard for a small business to own and control IP in the automobile supply chain. It's just the bigs are too powerful and they drive the story with the tier ones on how this is all gonna play out, and the smalls end up being order takers with margins that are very small, and they're asked to compress those margins every year, time and time and time again, you know, the 5% the, the back every year, right? If you've been in industry, you know that game. 
You sold it to me for a dollar this year, I need it for 95 next year. I don't care what inflation was, I don't care, and you better be super efficient. Well, that's because nobody in the chain owns the IP. The IP is owned by the tier one or the OE. So they're order takers. They have to sit and wait for, well, I hope they accept my price. If the world fragments for manufacturing, this means engineers are gonna be in huge supply because we, the tons of IP is gonna be created. Right? Tons of IP is going to be created. Because if you can figure out a way to create the IP and protect it as you ship it around the world for manufacturing, that's going to change everything in manufacturing. You don't have to hold it under a bushel basket. It's going to be like Apple Music. And you know, Does anybody remember Napster? So remember, the Wild West of music was everything was free, and it's, there was no IP or nothing, and you could do whatever you wanted. Right? And by the way, that's kind of true in manufacturing, that's why everybody's secretive. Because it's really hard to protect your IP, so nobody talks to anybody else about anything. If we go to, to software and additive manufacturing, then it's actually quite easy, and this is a debatable point, but I'll, I'll say this term, and you can, it's quite easy to figure out how to protect the IP, the same way that the industry got together and figured out how to protect music IP. And Napster went away. Right? And, and the, the whole industry decided, here's how you share royalties and here's how things flow around. So the same way that I move music all over the world, I could move parts. Right? And you could make the part anywhere. And this is what we see is going to actually come to fruition. So i got to watch my time and make sure we go. So this was in the Wall Street Journal just last month. So I think manufacturing is coming back to America. This chart was, I love seeing it, because I had not seen a chart like this before that showed, here's the manufacturing construction spending going on in America. And we haven't even begun to see most of this um, new funding that came from the government for manufacturing. So I think this chart is beginning to bear out what our hypothesis at Automation Alley has always been from 2016 when I took over, which is, we are going to see a renaissance in America around manufacturing because when you automate, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, the cost is the same in either country. And we are actually much better positioned to be the people that manage the automation through engineers and through all our staff than we could competing with uh, low cost labor. Right? We lived through, Michigan lived through, the 2000 to 2010, manufacturing employment went down and to the right for 10 straight years. 10 straight years we lost employment in manufacturing. And not just a little employment. We just went, we crashed because we were like Germany. We, we were totally dependent on manufacturing. And when it all went to China because the costs were 5x better than they were here, we lost, we lost our entire machine tool industry, right? You remember the, 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 the machine tool industry? We, Michigan owned that around the world. And when China and Mexico kind of came out at the same time, when both those countries came online, we lost about 80% of our machine tool industry. And that's the bare bones knowledge that you need to sort of build on top of all of manufacturing. So we've been back on our heels. But this is a great sign. I love seeing this because this really says proves out uh, with dollars what's actually happening. So I'm going into examples now. I got three, three or four examples to show you what's happening around the world. This is really recent. So Wharton did a challenge. They, they challenged ChatGPT and its MBA students to create feasible market ideas. Each team had to come up with 200 ideas. So it was the MBA students versus ChatGPT. So, the output, anybody seen this study? No, it was really, really great, I love reading about it. So the average probability of a human-generated idea was 40% and GPT was 49. So about the same, what they did was they put these ideas out on like TikTok interstitial ads and got people to click, would you buy this if we put that out there? And so the, the consumers didn't know, was this a chat GPT generated product or was this an MBA driven kind of idea? And uh, so it was about hand in hand, but they had like certain to buy, yeah, I really like it, yeah, it's kind of a cool idea. 
the certain device, ChatGPT offered 35 of the top 40. And it changed this now. Warden has said, oh my god, we have to rethink how we interact with artificial intelligence as MBA students because we, you know, it's not about humans getting all the creativity, it's about humans sifting through what humans and AI are going to do together. So I don't know if this is a feel-good story or a terrible story, but all I can say is it's reality. Right? We, we have to figure out how are we going to do this. So what does this mean? You know, from, from our perspective, like when I think about this, I say, well, idea generation is going to democratize. That's what the positive is. If I can marry myself with an AI, then anybody in the world can become an inventor. Right? This is a good thing for society. Right? You don't want, the way it is today is you can't, you know, you have to really know what you're doing or you have to think, like, in the future, anybody will be able to have access to knowledge. Knowledge is ubiquitous and free. Remember, I said, what's a world look like where knowledge is ubiquitous and free? It's going to look like people are going crazy with idea generation. It's going to be explosive in terms of new ideas that flood into the market. R&D has the potential to enormously fragment. By the way, this is written from the perspective of what am I saying to a CEO of a manufacturing firm? Because the last slide you'll see. Um, academics may want to teach rapid prototyping or, or, or you know, minimum viable product creation and how you do that alongside artificial intelligence now is your guide, right? Rather than just sort of um, you know, trying to get to the physical minimum viable product. You're like, well, first I'm going to keep it in this digital realm for a long time. What I say to corporations is, you know, we outsourced so much of our R&D in manufacturing over the last 30 years, right? Yeah, 30 years. So when I came out of school in, in the 80s, late 80s, it had begun to happen, because uh, like GE's Jack Welch started the whole neutron jack, we're gonna blow everything up and get rid of everything that costs us money. And one of the things that everybody in the world thought cost them money was R&D. Like, oh man, it's all these level one, two stuff. I want level nine, ten stuff. Guys, why can't you give me level nine, ten? Costing me tens of millions of dollars. All these scientists running around, you know. And so they outsourced everything. And they created relationships with academics and they did. But they said, look, it, we're just going to wait for the products to, to, to rise up and get to the point where maybe they're worthwhile and we'll, we'll come along and get them. What I'm saying now is you're going to be too late if you wait for that to happen. So in other words, like the pharmaceutical industry, they don't do their R&D, they have these, these small companies, and they, they, but they enter into craters with these small companies way back at the beginning. Contract research and development agreements. And these, these small, they say, we'll give you a little tiny bit of funding, and we're tied to you now, and if you ever rise up to the point where, where we're Pfizer and we can take you and now take this drug to market, then the money starts flowing for both of us. We're not doing that in manufacturing. It's either we do it in-house or it doesn't exist. Somebody else has it, we'll, you know, we'll figure it out. So what I'm saying to, to manufacturers and corporations is we need to reinstitute how we do R&D. We need to reinvent how we do R&D. And you need to think about it in an age of knowledge is ubiquitous and free. Idea generation is going to fragment. So how in the world do I capture that democratized idea generation in a way that I can profit from it and make sure I'm not threatened by it as, as business changes, right? Because every C-suite group is trying to make business model decisions, right? It's very easy to make decisions if your business model is secure and mature. You're just allocating resources on do I want more of this or less of this, and, and that's been the way it's been in manufacturing for a long time. You allocate resources. What's most difficult is betting, do I go all in on electric vehicles or not? That's an existential decision, right? If you don't play it right and you're too soon, you go bankrupt. If you're too late, you go bankrupt, right? Either way, but you have to get it right. And these decisions are occurring because of the pace of change around AI, and, and, and all the things I talked about, this is all occurring uh, in, the same, in the same vein. So, here's an example of uh, McLaren Senna. This is a beautiful vehicle. Uh, 
Laguna Seca is a race course out in Laguna, California, and it's where production car companies that build the highest end cars go to brag. And they run this course and they post their time. The best time in the world was a minute 27, or an hour 27, 62, whatever. I, I, I'm not a car guy, so don't hold me to that. I don't know if it's 62 and one hundredths, or if it's actually an hour twenty-seven, um, you'd think I should be a car guy, but I'm not. Uh, my dad was a car guy. That's probably why. <laughs> I'm going this way, Dad. You go that way. I'm going this way. Um, but what's interesting is the Zinger in 2019 beat the McLaren Senna by two seconds. Now, again, me not being a car guy, apparently this is a big freaking deal. If you're a car guy, two seconds off is like unheard of. And what's interesting is that is an 85% 3D printed vehicle that you could buy today. Now it costs $2 million. <laughs> it's $2 million. Jay Leno bought one. In fact, he tested it on his show. But that's not the point. The point is, these are all the components that are 3D printed in that vehicle. There's the skin, and there's the uh, actual Mitsubishi engine itself that is not 3D printed. Where is the world going? If I was a betting man, I'd be like, uh, I think we're probably gonna 3D print everything. What I gotta figure out is how to get my material cost, i.e. my powders or my red, whatever Dow and BASF are inventing, they gotta invent it faster, because we've gotta drive costs down. But it's coming. And again, it's back to the problem of, if, if someone has a 3D printer, and they're making titanium striker knees in Grand Rapids off this printer, which they do, I'm not making that up. They do the person and they make a unique knee joint or a hip joint or whatever, it's all 3D printed in titanium because they can make it perfect to your body. And it's a one up just what you want. <coughs> that printer is paid for already by the process that they're running. So the cost for me to make a titanium part independent of the knee is the cost of the titanium, right? The energy for that, that is, is, is an equation too. But if you think about it, again, because I don't need to build a titanium production plant to make any of these parts in titanium. Not that they're made in titanium, we're just using it as an example. This is how distributed manufacturing eats in because Stryker says, hey, I only run that machine from eight to five, but if I can run it from five to eight, Right? I, I've already paid for the machine. Hey, GM, you want to make parts on that? And GM can push a button from Detroit, Michigan, and that machine can be making parts in Grand Rapids. And it's a, it's a medical manufacturer. It has nothing to do with the auto industry. It doesn't matter. They have the capability because they have that machine. Again, no knowledge needs to be transferred to Stryker to make this happen. Right? This is the thing I'm talking about. This is the fundamental change in how we need to think about how manufacturing will be done, how AI is going to change everything we know. So that, that's, uh, that's uh, the zinger. Anybody here of a company called Relativity Space? Let me tell you about Relativity Space. So a traditional rocket takes 100,000 parts, 24 months to build, 48 month iteration time, which means if you want to make an engineering change, it takes four years to work it through the whole system to get that part done because, for whatever reason, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why it would take four years. I've been told it takes four years iteration time to get a new rocket different from the rocket that they designed, because there's lots of little changes in it. It takes four years. And it's a global chi uh, supply chain that's dependent on things like Russian rockets, right? Uh, Russian engines. Um, and by the way, it also costs about 60 to $80 million to build a rocket. And it takes, um, yeah, two years to build it. So there's a company in Long Beach, California called Relativity Space. And they're building rockets, they're 3D printing them. The whole rocket. They go from 100,000 parts to 1,000 parts. This whole fuselage, that's 3D printed. It's done with AI. By the way, everything I showed you is done with AI, the, the, the uh, Zinger. That's done with AI. Because you can't do this anymore. Relativity Space, when they build that fuselage, 
it, it builds hot, right? It's hot, it's hot metal that's coming out. They're welding it in these little circles. So it, it's, it's, when metal cools, it wants to deform, right? That's, that's my only engineering I'm going to give you guys today, right? Once it wants to cool, it wants to deform. So the AI has to tell the machine how to do it. There's no human involved. AI says, do it this way. And he says, when it, it's Tim Ellis is the CEO, and he's on the World Economic Forum board with me. So I get to talk to him fairly often. By the way, when I first met him, he got a $2 million investment from Jeff, Jeff Bezos. The next time I met him, he was worth $2 billion. He doesn't talk to me anymore. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not in his league anymore. But when it gets built, it's built for it. And when it cools, it becomes perfectly cylindrical. That can only be done because every little time it puts a bead down, the computer is trying to evaluate how is it going to deform and how does it come back, right? So it takes them two months to build it, and it, it only costs $12 million. And by the way, you can go watch. They, they built 53 rockets, no two the same. Because it's computer, right? I, oh, I'm going to change this. Great, the computer says I can make it. Okay, put it in. Off it goes. So they've made 53 iterations since they started this business. And that was like right before COVID, 2019. So they made 53 iterations in four years. You know, four years to make one iteration of a Boeing or a Raytheon rocket, right? 100 to one part reduction, right? So I just put this out there as an example to say, don't think that the way, the way manufacturers speak to me is the way they view 3D printing additive is I have a part and I want to see if I can make it additively and oh, it's too expensive. We don't want to do it additive. It's too expensive. It's, it's still cheaper to, 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 to just stamp it out. right? And I think you're missing the point because you want to think, what could I do differently once my design constraints are removed? Can I combine that part with a bunch of other parts? Can I print the whole car? Today you can't, right? It's not feasible. Musk is trying. He's stamping out half of the car, the frame, the body in white, frame. Comes out of one big mold. You know? Now, I've asked this question. I haven't got an answer yet. What happens if the car gets in an accident? Did you just have a $24,000 accident for a fender bender? because it's irreparable. <laughs> I don't think he's talking to the market that way yet, but that's a, that's a pretty important question you gotta answer, because it's one, it's one piece. You don't pull the bumper off, you scrap the whole car. But, we said, it's cheaper to steer it. There's a company out of MIT, just spun out, called Surat. They have a design where they have this huge laser, this laser, <laughs> you know, that we, that we see. They split the laser into two million beams. So today, high-powered uh, high uh, or, or, or powder bed laser systems, you see the laser, you got them here, then they trace out what they're making. They shoot all two million at once, and it just, shoo, it just and the part builds up, because it just all is done at once. It's going to change the cost. Remember, it's all a cost model. It's going to change the cost parameters for 3D printing. They think that they can get to parity with stamping utensils by 2030. The reason why they, why did they pick stamping utensils? Because it's the most commoditized metal process in the world. Stamp a fork, 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 costs nothing. It's the cost of the metal. Little energy in the stamp, and it just goes by and the forks kick out into a big bucket, and they run all the time. He thinks they can 3D print a fork cheaper than you can stamp it out. Right? That's a threat. Right? If I'm talking to a CEO of a manufacturing plant, I'm like, you need to pay attention to this. Because if your plant is full of CNC machines and stamping machines, you have to really pay attention. Uh, there's a company working with us in, in um, Automation Alley. We have this foreign direct investment program where we work with big companies around the world to set up shop in Michigan. Right? That's one of our core values for being a nonprofit. This company from India, it's an additive manufacturing company doing work with manufacturers over in India. And he came over here and we said, well, what, what kind of space, industrial space do you need? He says, oh, I just need office space. And he showed me his plant, plant in India. It's, it's in an office park with like 20 3D printers all humming 
You know, because there's no, he doesn't need to, to, to vent, he's not doing metal. He's doing things where, you know, 3D printers like you, they're running right in your facility. And as long as you can do production quality, you don't need all the manufacturing rigmarole, right? You can do it in different ways. So this, these are just examples I'm sharing with you of how you want to pay attention to where the world is going. So, yes, Siri, I hear you. So, the thing that frustrates the people that I talk to is, but I can't tell you where you are. So AI is changing rapidly. 3D printing is changing rapidly. Additive uh, ro robotics is changing rapidly. All of them are changing at their own curves. But if you are in the business of predicting the business model, I need to remember, I don't, I don't talk with the engineering departments at these companies. I talk with the owners. And the owner is concerned with what's happening in production and engineering. But the owner's concerned about, is my business model still valid? All of it. And what we say is, if AI and additive and robotics and software and everything is all changing rapidly, then your world is changing at that function of how many things are changing rapidly that affect your business times all of them. And so I can't tell you if you're here or if you're here. If you're here and you start investing, I agree with you, you're dead. You're gonna exhaust your money before you can make that transition. If you're here, maybe it's too late because what happens in, with these ideas now is somebody has a good idea. The world is awash in cash. And so Tesla has a good idea and all the cash flows to Tesla. And none of it goes to GM and Ford anymore because the, the market has decided that Tesla's won. They're going to be worth 700 billion and you guys are worth nothing. Thanks for playing. Your capital costs are going to be this high and Tesla's are this high. Right? So it, it, it matters how you define this and how you think about your business. And this is where it matters as we talk about how is AI going to impact what you guys do every day? We really need to think, how is AI going to change business models? And start predicting, how does AI change the business model? Because the business model changes everything in the organization. And that's where you guys can really come out of school and be like, oh my god, I really know the fear that's going on out in the market that can create huge opportunity. Remember, the flip side of fear is opportunity. Right? There's a threat, there's an opportunity. I think this is a much bigger threat to China and to other industrialized countries than it is to America. Remember, we outsourced all of it. This is actually a huge wind in our back. And you saw that curve go up. But we need organizations like yourself to really understand how to navigate this to make sure that this can, that this can come to fruition. So last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to be out of time. So what are we doing about it? So we came up with a program called Project Diamond. It means Distributed Independent Agile Manufacturing on Demand. We have 300 small manufacturers on the network today. Our goal, each one of them with a printer capable of producing production parts, parts that can be used to sell to somebody else or to use in your own facility that are actually valuable, not just prototyping parts for visualization and viewing and that kind of thing. Actual production. Uh, this was this was paid for um, 2020. It was paid for by funds that said, "Hey, we don't we don't want to rely on PPD from China. We're going to make it here. We're going to do that through additive." And we knew that the minute we stand this up, COVID crisis is going to be over. Guess what? It just happened to work out. And, and sadly, I, I, I hate that we participated in this because it means there's a war going on. Ukraine called and said, "We need tourniquets right away." It's going to take us eight months to stand up a factory to make tourniquets. We turned on this network, so it was a great proof of concept for us, and we made 3,500 tourniquets in five days. Right? That's the power of additive. Right? By the time now, obviously, they stood up their factory eventually, and they started kicking out tourniquets for, for wounded uh, soldiers on the front line. But we were able to participate in that, and it was us and Sweden, the only two people in the world that were capable of of doing it in an efficient way because we had this capacity. We had 300 manufacturers ready to take an order. And we were able to, we have to look in on all of their devices, right? We can't see their IP, but we can look in and see what, if they're printing or not or whatever. And we were able to work with them to, to develop all these products. So, 
The whole point of this is if you're a small manufacturer, you have access to all of your friends, and you can print 300 something of a time, same as a big guy. And our plan is to get unlimited. Right? Our next phase is, this is all in Oakland County, our next phase is to have another 300 manufacturers join the network. There's 2,400 manufacturers within 25 miles in Oakland County. Right? There's another 2,000 in Macomb County right next door. There's another 2,000 in Wayne County right next door. Right? If, if, in a perfect world, we have 6,000, we can make 6,000 things at once. All distributed and the incremental cost is zero. Right? Think about it, the guy who puts the order in, I don't need any capital anymore. I don't even need a factory, right? I can push a button and I can distribute it to as many printers as I want. And so we're trying to build a network that the manufacturers own. So as a nonprofit, there's a company trying to do this called Zometry. The thing, that, the big problem I have with Zometry is they're trying to step between the customer and the manufacturer. And they're trying to disintermediate all the little guys and say, I'm going to use you for now, but eventually I'm going to own the customer relationship and I'm going to take it direct and I'm going to become this great big monolithic manufacturer that makes everything everywhere, right? And that's the point. There's been books written about this. There's somebody who wrote a book, I forget his name. He said there's, you know, in 2050 there's going to be five manufacturers in the world. Each one is going to be worth multi-trillions of dollars and they're going to make everything, right? The pr that breaks down when you think, wait a minute, this was way more efficient than that. Way more efficient. I need to use the law of large numbers against that model. And we want to do that because we want the manufacturers to stay between their customer and themselves. Own the relationship, and then you use your buddies to make all the parts. But you own the, and we may never see who that customer is because we don't want them. So that's what we're trying to do. So I have some examples. I, I think I'm just about out of time. I'll give you one. Valentine Baca. This guy He's a manufacturer, makes vodka, but he's not a manufacturer in the sense, he didn't know anything about it. He buys his machines from Italy, they bottle the vodka, comes out of Ferndale, Michigan. He taught himself, he downloaded this open source CAD program, and he taught himself CAD, he said it was really actually much simpler than I thought, because he was waiting five to six weeks to get parts from the Italian company on a machine that had been out of warranty forever. But it's a highly specialized machine that bottles liquor, apparently, He's like, this is industry standard. If you, if you bottle liquor, you're, you have an Italian machine that bottles liquor. He now prints all his own Orient parts. He prints them overnight. He said, yeah, I made a couple mistakes. I came in and it was wonky. And I just, I just adjusted it and printed it again the next day. This is where the world is going, right? Where this guy's able to say, I'm going to make all my own parts. Lead times overnight. This Aaron Liquid Systems is the guy. He was buying $99 stainless steel valves from China. He figured out he could print them in carbon fiber on the printer we gave him for two bucks. He uses four to six per machine. Doesn't need to go to China anymore. By the way, the lead time and everything's killing him. And he found carbon fiber is just as corrosive resistance as stainless steel. So why am I not, not going that route? Um, the last thing I want to say is what will make additive take off is these four things. The reason why additive doesn't work today is there's no global ID. I can't push a product to you because I don't know who you are. You can't be anonymous. There's no system yet to determine how we make it so that you can't be anonymous. We need to know who you are, we need to know what capabilities you have, which leads to digital rights management, like I just talked about in the music industry. We need to find a way that I can share my IP with you, you can print it on your printer, but you can't steal my idea. Last is digital recipes. We have to agree on if this is the combination that makes up this alloy, then how does that get certified by a BASF or a DAO that, that if you use that powder on this machine, you will always get the part the way you need it, right? And by the way, 3D printing companies are working on taking pictures with lasers of every layer they lay down and putting it to the cloud. That's a perfect representation, right? You can't get a better quality shot than that. If you lay down a piece of metal, you take a picture of it, and then you, you, you like, a, like a CAT scan, you can reassemble that whole part at any moment. That's going to play into that digital product recipes and quality and certification. Right now, we're, we're, we have a tough time in the auto industry because everything has to be PPAP'd, right? Well, PPAP is tied to a plan and a, and, a, and a process. They don't know how to PPAP a 3D printed part coming out of a 3D printer that could be anywhere in the world at any moment. In fact, it gives them heartburn, right? Because the whole system is designed to never allow this to happen. And we're saying, but this is where the world is going. 
You have to allow this to happen, or you're going to be toast, right? You, someone will do it, because why do you think Apple is desperate to make a car? Apple wants to make a car because Apple thinks they can provide a better user experience, and the only thing missing is they can't quite figure out how to make a car yet. Right? They've tried for years and years and years. It's still really, really complex. Kudos to, to Musk for what he's been able to do at Tesla. He really is a visionary. But let's hope Apple doesn't figure it out either because, you know, it's David and Goliath. The, 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 the tech industry has way, way, way more money than any other industry in the world. And they're itching to disrupt everything they can. So if we don't disrupt ourselves, we will be disrupted. It's just a, it's a matter of fact. So that's everything. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry I went a minute long on you guys or so. I went four minutes long. I apologize for that. Um, thank you for your time, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it, and I, I hope you uh, uh, have a good time the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.